Acts chapter 19, we're going through the book of Acts. We've been through in the book of Acts for a while, and we're plowing through. We're in Acts chapter 19. We're going to look at verse 23 to 41. And I want to talk to you this morning a little bit about mob mentality. Uh, we know it in terms like Antifa and different things. It's kind of interesting how the Bible is such an ancient book and yet such a brand new relevant book. There's always lessons for us to learn out of God's Word. And basically, we're going to read Acts 19. And Ruth, if you'll go to that other, other slide that I've got up there. Um, we're going to look at a riot that started in the book of Acts. And how did this riot start and how did this riot stop? So we're going to walk through. And I do want to read this, this entire passage. So if you have your Bible, just follow along with me. And we're going to read this together. And then I want to come back and just make some comments and some observations. Acts 19, starting in verse 23. And I'm reading out of a Holman Christian Standard Bible, so it may read a little bit differently than yours. <clears throat> verse 23, about that time there was a major disturbance about the way. The way is what, what they call Christians, who they call the Christians early in, that, in, in time. They didn't know what to call them, so they called them the way. For a person named Demetrius... A silversmith who made silver shrines to Artemis provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. Now let me stop here. In some of your Bibles, King James, New King James, some of the Bibles will say Diana. It's not a mistake. The, uh, uh, the Greeks called this goddess, this false goddess, Artemis. The Romans called her Diana. So when you look in your Bible and you say, it doesn't say Artemis, it says Diana. It's the same non-being. It was a false god, false goddess. But in some translations it's Artemis, some it's Diana. Verse 25, when he had assembled them as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also in all, almost all of Asia, this man, Paul, has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. Not only do we run the risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin, the very one that all of Asia and the world worship. When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, <clears throat> dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the prov prov provincial Officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. This amphitheater, by the way, would hold somewhere around twenty to 25,000 people. It was huge. Some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some Jews in the crowd had gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front. They said, Alexander, get out there and say something. Motioning with his hand, Alexander wanted to make the, his defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. When the city clerk had calmed down the crowd, he said, People of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and the image that fell from heaven? Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. For you have brought these men here who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a case against anyone, the courts are in session and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it must be decided in a legal assembly. In fact... We run a risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today since there is no justification that we can give a, as a reason for our disturbance. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. People do things in groups that they would never do 
as individuals. How many of you remember as a teenager doing things in groups that were not the best decisions? Like I remember going with some of my friends in high school to roll yards, to egg stuff. I would have never done that on my own. But you get a bunch of people together, especially a bunch of boys. Girls are smarter. You get a bunch of boys together and go, hey, you know what would be fun? That's usually when the police are calling, somebody's going to get hurt. So there's this, there's this thing that happens that sometimes it's mischievous when you get groups of people together that you would never do as an individual, but sometimes it turns into a mob. I grew up watching westerns. I liked westerns. You know, uh, John Wayne, James Arnest, Matt Dillon. And all these westerns sooner or later had an episode where they've arrested a murderer and he's in jail and he's going to stand trial and he's probably going to be hung. But in the meantime, there's a bunch of people over at the saloon getting liquored up to come over and lynch him. Y'all remember these? And then here's Matt Dillon who comes out on the sidewalk with his gun. He's about 8 foot 12. And he's standing there and here comes these drunks from the saloon. And they're carrying a rope. And he identifies the leader. And he says to the leader, I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen this same scenario in a movie or a show. He says to the leader, you may get me, but I want y'all to know I'm going to get you first. Whatever happens to me, you're going down. And they usually back off and he talks them down and everything. It's a mob. This was a mob of people. Now, let me give you the backstory. This backstory is really important. Well, first, let me give you this quote. I, I don't know this person. I can give you their name. But this, is, this was an interesting quote they gave on mobs. Quote, Mob believes everything it's told, provided only that it is repeated over and over and over. The grosser the lie, the bigger the lie, the cruder the lie, the more readily it is believed and followed. End of quote. Does that sound familiar? If you say it long enough and loud enough and it's gross enough and disgusting enough, then pe enough people will start following it and they don't even know why they're following it. They don't even know why they're participating in this destructive act. And let me go ahead and say this. I was going to say this at the end of the sermon, but I'll say it now. Mobs divide. They don't unite. Mobs create problems, not solutions. Mobs have never solved one issue. Mobs have never helped one thing. They just destroy. It's always been that way. I like what Mark Twain said, quote, It's easier to fool people than to convince people they have been fooled. <laughs> it's true. It's easier to fool people than to say to people, You know you've been fooled. No, I have not. Because then our pride gets in the way. So we have this riot. How did it start? How did it stop? In order to understand how it started, you've got to look at the backstory, which go back just a couple of verses to verse, 9, verse 18. Now remember that Paul, went, Paul stayed longer in Ephesians than any other place. Uh, he stayed there three years. But he had, in Ephesus, he, he went for three months to the synagogue. We talked about this last Sunday. For three months he went to the synagogue once a week, and then he ended up going to the hall of Tyrannus, and he rented a space, history tells us, every day, seven days a week, for two years, from 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, and every day for five hours, he, he, de he debated, he argued, and persuaded people concerning the kingdom of God. So as a result, a lot of people in, in Ephesus had heard the gospel. Some of them laughed at him. Some of them thought it was a joke, but a lot of people believed. Enough so to where he affected the economy. Now, this town of Ephesus, uh, what I read last, this past week, that Ephesus had about 250,000 people in it. So it wasn't a mega city, but it was a big city. I mean, a quarter of a million people is a lot of people. And one man standing up, talking about Jesus every day, five hours a day, every day for two years. He impacted that city to the point that he actually impacted their economy. He wasn't going after the economy. He was going after their hearts and souls. He wasn't telling people, don't buy idols. He wasn't standing in front of gift shops and saying, don't go in there. He was telling them about Jesus. Because here's the thing. 
I said this last week. God has not called us to make more Republicans or Democrats or heterosexuals. God has called us to make disciples. He has called us to lead people to Christ. And when Jesus said this in John 12, 32, If I am lifted up, I will draw them into me. If people get Jesus Christ in their heart and soul, he will make the changes that are necessary. We don't have to fix people. Right? We don't. We just have to tell them about the one who can fix them, who can forgive them for their sins, who can bring them life abundantly on this earth and eternal life up in heaven. So our job is to introduce people to Christ. And that's all, that's all Paul was doing. He wasn't trying to uh, create a problem, but everywhere he went he created a problem. Because here's the thing. Jesus creates problems. He divides the wheat and the tares, the true believers and the false believers. He came to seek and save the lost. He never made any apology or explanation about that. He said, here's why I'm here. Paul, that's just what he was there for. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he affected their economy in such a way that you've got to look at verse 18 here. And many who had, believed, many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, while many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone, so they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. Now let me tell you how much that is. According to the ESV Study Bible Notes, that's about $6 million. One piece of silver was one man's wage for one day. So when we say that a few people, it wasn't, you know, a handful of people in somebody's backyard burned a few books, a few idols. Six million dollars. He was shutting down idol worship. And it was a problem for them. Wow. In this way, the word of the Lord flourished and prevailed. So after these events, Paul, and then verse 23, now there's this major disturbance about these people. A person named Demetrius, I love this, silversmith who had made shrines to Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. Money. He's talking about money. Right? Uh, let's see, verse 26. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also almost all of Asia, this man has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by man or hand are not gods. Not only do we run a risk of our business being discredited, but also the people, the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. Now watch this. When he got up to speak, he said... Our business is being affected. Money. Oh, by the way, our worship is being affected. He should have started with that one. Our worship is being affected. And it's going to cost us some money. But no, he started with the money. Why? Because with idol worship and with false teachers, it's always about the money. It's always about the money. They use this, they use enough of the Bible to convince well-meaning people to send them money. It's never about the worship of the true and living God. It's about their money. And what Demetrius was saying to those people is, this guy Paul's costing us a lot of money. And our God, our goddess is being blasphemed by this guy. Interesting. There were two... Oh, I've got a lot I want to share with you. Let's do this. Mark, Mark's, Mark Acts 19 there. Keep, keep your finger there. And let's go to Exodus 20. And I want us to look at the Ten Commandments. Just briefly. I want to read them. 
This is important. There are ten commandments that God gave the nation of Israel when they first came out of Egypt, and he said, I want you to live by these ten commandments. The first four commandments are vertical. It's my relationship with God. The next six are horizontal. It's my relationship with other people. You can't, watch this, watch my hands. You can't get this right if this is not right. That's why God started with the first four that dealt with their relationship with him, and once your relationship with God is right, your relationship with other people can be right. So he didn't start with thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery and stuff until he dealt with the vertical first. So look at what he says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God, that's Elohim, spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God. I am the Jehovah your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Watch this. Commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the first thing he said. Verse 1, I'm establishing who I am. I'm the Lord God. So now that everybody understands who's saying this, let me tell you what I want to tell you. Number one, you don't have other gods before me. Period. That's, is that easy to understand? Does anybody un misunderstand that? Is that unclear to anybody? Okay, look at the next one. You do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything um, in the heavens above, or on the earth below, or in the waters under the earth, do not bow and worship to them, and do not serve them. For I, the Jehovah, your Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, punishing the children, the punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. The third commandment here, verse seven: Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses His name. The fourth one, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He deals with all that stuff before he ever deals with personal relationships. God, from Genesis to Revelation, does not like idol worship. Now, here's the thing. Idol worship is not having a little fat boot on your coffee table or your mantelpiece. Idol worship is anything that comes between God and you. Anything. could be your golf game. could be your best friend. Could be your hobby. Could be your job. Could be your health. Here's God, here's you. Anything that comes between God and you, any of that that ever comes here is an idol. And I would submit to you that all over the world we are idolaters in different ways. You might have a little fat Buddha on your coffee table, but you may be an idolater just the same. And God never has liked it and he never will because he's not going to share his glory with anybody else. Now, in Ephesus, let me give you some history. Artemis, Diana, was their goddess that they worshipped. False god, they worshipped. Now, they had two celebrations a year. They had one, in, um, <laughs> this is interesting. They had one of, one of their two festivals or celebrations was around the birthday of Artemis or Diana. Now, how does a false god have a birthday? All right, look at, I think it's verse 30. Oh, man, let me find it. I should have marked it in my Bible. I read it. Let's see. Where came down from heaven. Y'all help me with this. Somebody find that for me. It's in our text. I should know this. Where is it? 35. Thank you. I knew it was in there. When the city clerk had calmed the crowd down, but he said, People of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell down from heaven? Now watch this. According to archaeologists, a lot of meteors fell in that area. And one of the meteors that fell looked like, was shaped sort of like a woman with several breasts. And they worshipped that rock and named that rock Artemis or Diana. And they marked the date. So they had a date for the birth. And every year they worshipped Artemis, Diana on that date. The second one, the second festival they had every year, was called the day of or the week of Art, Artemisia, Artemisia, Artemis, Artemisia. And during that week, 
young men and women would come to town and they would pledge their love to each other and they would get married to each other. It was sort of like Easter, it was sort of like Valentine's Day. That's a good day to get, get engaged, I guess. I don't know. I got engaged at Christmas. I don't know. I don't know anymore. There's so many. Like when I, when, when I proposed to Tracy, I said, would you marry me? She said, okay. <laughs> now you've got to set up the proposal. Like it's an event. Like when we got married, it wasn't an event. Like we had a cake, but everybody brought something. It was like a potluck. You know, it's just it's different. But their second festival or celebration was Artemisia, where they would bring young people together, and they would pledge their love to each other, and they would commit to each other, and their form of marriage. Twice a year, they had celebrations, festivals to worship. Stay with me an idol twice a year, once around the birth. Now, I'm fixing to walk a tightrope, and I'm not going to, if you're a parent, don't think I'm fixing to mess stuff up here, but I want to say something to you that I hope every adult gets and the kids don't get, okay? Every year in December, we celebrate, as Christians, we celebrate The birth of who? Jesus Christ. The virgin birth of Christ. Every year we celebrate him, Christmas. The next biggest holiday in America is Easter. Why Christians, brothers and sisters, why do we celebrate Easter? What's Easter about? It is the what? The resurrection of who? Jesus Christ. So the two biggest celebrations we have in our culture are Christmas and Easter. One is about a birth. But we have taken those two celebrations and we've taken the reality of it and put it on the back burner and spent billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars every single solitary year, not for the reality, but for the fantasy. Were they idolaters? Are we? Yes. So when I read this, and I I read that this week, and I thought, wow, they have two big celebrations a year to honor someone that doesn't exist. Interesting. Tom Constable, in his commentary on this passage, said, this is interesting, this is so good. They had these, this mob, they had vested interests disguised as patriotism. Now that was written 30 years ago in a commentary. They had vested interests disguised as patriotism. Does that sound familiar? Interesting. So that's how it started. Now, I didn't mention this in the first service, but I want to... I want to share something with you that I thought was fascinating. Look at verse 28. When they heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Look at verse 34. When they recognized that Alexander was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After 9-11, our world was rocked. When some terrorists flew some planes into the World Trade Center, into the Pentagon, and crashed, another one crashed in the field. And our economy was affected, and we were scared. You remember? And it wasn't too long after that, that in every, I I went to New York six weeks after, three three or four weeks after 9-11. I was with Billy Graham prayer team, and we just, total strangers would come up to us on the street, we had on lanyards that said Billy Graham prayer team. Total strangers would walk up and with tears running down their face and say, would you pray for me? I got somebody, in that bil- I got somebody over there in that pile. And we haven't heard from them. Shortly after 9-11, in every baseball game, in every stadium in America, the seventh inning, what did we do? We sang what? God Bless America. Remember? Land that I love. 
Do y'all remember? You ever watch baseball? Are you with me? Every game, every major league game, in every stadium, every night, seventh inning, somebody would sing God Bless America. And people would stand there with a beer in one hand and a hot dog in the other with tears running down their faces, people that didn't even believe in God, singing God Bless America. Why? Because we were threatened. Our way of life was threatened. Our economy was threatened. We were scared. My father told me that during World War II that every church, you could go by every church and it was full of people praying. Why? They were scared. You know what happened here? Many scholars and historians say that great is, the, great is Artemis of the Ephesians wasn't a statement, it was a song. Now can you imagine a stadium that would hold, an amphitheater that would hold 20,000 people and it's full of people and when Alexander gets up to speak and they say he's a Jew, that Paul guy's a Jew, he's cost us six million dollars, he's messed this whole town up, he's messed up our way of life, he's messed up our economy, he's ruining everything. So when Alexander goes out there and they go he's a Jew and he starts to speak, you know what they started doing? Watch this. Here's what they started doing. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Goddess that I love. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They didn't just chant for two hours. They sung for two hours about who they believed in. Because they were scared. Isn't that interesting? Two hours. This went on. How did it stop? The mayor. The Bible says city clerk, but it was, the guy was the mayor. He goes out there and he moves his hands. And he basically just told them, look, y'all are breaking the law. You all going to jail. If these guys are wrong, they're going to jail. Go on home. Go. You are dismissed. Get out. It's amazing how God can speak through anybody to get his message across. He spoke through this town clerk. In Acts chapter 5, he spoke through a guy named Gamaliel. This is not the first time we've seen this in Acts 5, where Gamaliel said to these priests, these rabbis that wanted to kill those, the believers, he said to them, look, guys, listen up. Just everybody take a chill pill. That's in the Greek. Everybody take a chill pill. And understand something. If this is not of God, it's going to go away. These people are going to go away. These followers of the way, if this is not of God, they're going away. But if it is of God, you're not going to stop it. But I think in the meantime, all of us in this room, we just need to calm down. God spoke through Gamaliel. God spoke through a city clerk. God spoke through... Nebuchadnezzar, after he went crazy and came back to his senses. God spoke through Potiphar. Numbers 22, God even spoke through a donkey. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. Governments rise, governments fall. Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And God can do whatever he wants to do if it's in his decision-making power to do it. He can speak through anybody, any place, anything, anytime. He is sovereign. God can do anything he wants to do if he wants to do it. So God took this town clerk and pushed him out there and says, go out there and tell these people to calm down. And he probably thought it was his idea. That's the thing about God. He, gives, he, he, he leads you to do great stuff and then you do that stuff like you think you're so smart. It was God. God pushed that city clerk out there. He said, go out there and stop this mess. He goes out there and he gives a little speech and they all go home. So, what does this mean to us? What does this mean to us? G. Campbell Morgan, I love G. Campbell Morgan. He, he, he went to be with the Lord in 1945. 1945. I'm going to give you a quote he said that sounds like he wrote it this morning. About the church. About persecuted church around the world. Our friends, I showed you on the slide, they're part, they're part of a persecuted church. They can't, go, they can't go public. 
These people you saw, they can't go public. They'll go to jail. Our brothers and sisters all around the world are in jail right now. We're not, but they are. Some have been martyred. Some have been murdered just because they believe in Jesus. Here's what G. Campbell Morgan said in 19... He died in 1945, so he said this before. The church persecuted has always been the church pure and therefore the church powerful. The church patronized has always been the church in peril and therefore the church paralyzed. There's always been persecution of the church. There always will be persecution of the church, and it's going to get worse as we get coming closer and closer to the coming of Christ. I love what G. Campbell Morgan said about that. I've shared this with you before. G. Campbell Morgan said about the coming of Christ, I never begin my work in the morning without thinking that perhaps he may interrupt my work to begin his own. I'm not looking for death. I'm looking for him. I'm looking for him. Now think about this. The church persecuted has always been the church pure. And therefore the church powerful. The church patronized has always been the church in peril and therefore the church paralyzed. There are churches that are walking away from this book. It's called the Bible. There are denominations walking away from the Bible. Denominations. I'm not saying every denomination is bad, but there are denominations that are in mass, walking away from the truth of the Scripture. I would not want to be them. I would not want to be those pastors when Jesus comes. After the first service, somebody told me that they heard, they, they read this week that the um, United Methodist Council has taken away the campus and all the facilities of the largest Methodist church in the state of Georgia because they are conservative in their theology, and they happen to believe this Bible is God's Word, and they happen to believe that Jesus is God's Son. And because of that, the United Methodist Church has taken away their campus and everything they own and said, if you want to believe in Jesus, that's fine, but you're going to have to get out. Now, that happened this week. This kind of stuff is going on. You may not know that, but this is going on. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we're going to see the wheat separated from the tares, the righteous from the unrighteous, the true believers from people that just religion was just a thing to do to make money. When I read Acts 19, I'm thinking, wow, this is like reading the newspaper. (laughs) This is like reading the newspaper. Because what happened to those people is what's happening today. And I'm telling you, if you're a visitor... I may not get you back after stuff, the stuff I said this morning, but let me just tell you something. This church believes the Bible is God's word. We always have. We always will. This is the hill I'm going to die on. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the son of the living God. He is the savior of the world. He is the only hope we have. And the Bible is the living word of the living God and everything God said in here, everything in this from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 is the living, breathing word of the Almighty God Himself. I don't care what denominations and other churches do. As for me and my church, we're going to serve the Lord. That's where we stand on this stuff. It's amazing to me when I read that how current it is to today. Because of Jesus, the, and here, here I guess is a takeaway I want to give you before we, I wrap up here. The power of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the gospel is the only thing that can change lives. And when Jesus and the Holy Spirit are allowed to rule and reign, Marriages are restored. Families are saved. Communities are reached. Cultures are transformed. What America needs today is not 320 million people arguing with each other. What America needs today is 320 million people to get on our face before the Lord Jesus Christ and humble ourselves before him. He is the only hope we have. And we need to be telling people that. I'm not trying to make you Republican. I want you to be Christian. 
I'm not trying to make you Democrat. I want you to be Christian. Jesus and Jesus alone has the power to change. Now, here's my issue with this sermon. I don't have a conclusion. So I guess I'm going to kind of, Minnie Pearl used to say, we're done singing now. So I'm going to take that from her and say, I'm done preaching now. I don't, I don't have a way to stop. I don't have a way to land this plane, so I'm done. So let me pray, and we're going to sing another song of worship. Father, we thank you so much for the truth of the book of Acts. Thank you for giving us a history of the early church, the very first church that ever existed and what they went through and how they grew and how they were built and the challenges they faced. Oh, Lord God, may we be a church that is true to you. That when everybody in this room and our children and our grandchildren go to meet you, that we can hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want from, to hear from you, Lord, is, John, you did good. You were faithful to my word. You were faithful to preach it, to teach it, and to live it. And I'm proud of you. Come on home. Lord, may we be a church that makes a difference in this community and in this world. May we be people that go to work tomorrow and go to school and go to our places where we're going to go with the idea that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am to make other disciples for Jesus Christ. I'm to make a difference in my conversation and in my conduct. I'm supposed to be different. Help us, Lord, to be different, we pray. Help us to make a difference in this world, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.